Good day students, uh, welcome to the part 2 of the New York Regents High School Exam Integrated Algebra Review. Uh, if you want to get access to this document, you can find it on nysebregents.com. Uh, we're going to be going over question 7 to 13 on this installment. Before I start, I just want to commend you for taking the time to go over this uh, presentation. Hopefully it helps prepare you and you can score really well on your, on your exam. Alright, let's go ahead and take a look at number 7. Number 7, the expression 9a squared minus 64b squared is equivalent to... This is a, uh, is a factorization problem. So, uh, we have a difference of squares here. How do I know what's the difference of squares? Well, the first and uh, second terms are perfect squares, okay? 9 is a square, a squared is a square, 64 is a square, and b squared is a square. So how do you factor out the difference of squares? Well, this is a general formula. a squared minus b squared factors into a plus b times a minus b. Okay? So all you do is you take the square root of the first term and the last term. Okay? And then you add and subtract the square root. So the square root of a squared is a and the square root of b squared is b. And then you add and subtract it. Alright, so let's take a look at this. 9a squared minus 64 b squared. If I square root uh, the first term, what does that yield? If I square root the second term, what does that yield? Also? If I, uh, let me do that on the side, the square root of 9a squared, the square root of 9 is 3, and the square root of a squared just divide the power by 2, which is 1, so it's 3a, and the square root of 64b squared, the square root of 64 is 8, and the square root of b squared is just b, if you divide the power by 2. So I'm going to add and subtract these square roots, these two roots, okay? Because this is like my a, and this is like my b, so plus or minus, all right? So the, fa the factored form is going to be uh, 3a plus 8b times 3a minus 8b, okay? So let's see what option uh, this one matches. Um, well, it looks very much like 3 but it's reversed. So the question is, does multiplication commute? Absolutely, multiplication commutes uh, because a times b is the same thing as uh, b times a, right? So I can rewrite this as 3a minus 8b and times 3a plus 8b. So it doesn't matter the order of multiplication, you always get the same answer. So the answer to number 7 is 3, okay? All right. All right, we're going to along to question uh, eight. It says the scatter plot below shows a profit by month for a new company for the first year of operation. Kate drew a line of best fit as shown in the diagram. Given the line, what is the best estimate for profit in the 18th month? Okay, so this uh, chart is basically testing your ability to read graphs accurately. Um, so. Uh, it's important for you to draw perfectly straight vertical and horizontal lines when um, reading a graph, okay? So, I'm starting from my input, my independent axis, which is the month. We're starting from 18, right? So, from 18, I'm going to go, starting from 18, I'm going to trace up to the graph and see what my output is, okay? So, if I start from 18, I'm going to draw a perfectly straight horizontal or vertical line. I hit my line, this is where it hits the line. This line tells me the vertical line that will determine my output. I'm sorry, the horizontal line that determines my output. So starting from there, I draw a perfectly straight uh, horizontal line, and that's my output. And we can clearly see that it is down here, very close to 40,000. So uh, let's see what the answer is going to be. If you take a look at this graph, in between 40 and 50 is 45. Okay, we can clearly see that this is below 45, so it cannot be this option. So what is between 40 and 45? So this right here is 45,000. Between 40 and 45 is 42,500. So our answer is option 3. These two are way too small uh, to be the correct output. Okay, so when drawing this, you have to be really careful to ensure your vertical line is perfectly straight, like press your horizontal line. Alright? Okay, now let's move on to question number 9. It says, what, is, what statement illustrates the additive uh, property? So we probably can use this opportunity to go over uh, the different properties of equality. Okay? Um, 
I also have a clip on properties of equality that I've made. You can just search it on my on my page, and you can see all the properties um, of equality, multiplicative and additive properties of, of uh, equality. Okay. All right. So let's get, look at option one. First of all, if you look at the word identity, what does identity mean? Um, identity basically means that uh, you end up with what you started with, something that's identical. Okay. After an operation, act on it. So on the on this side here, we're starting with six, and we're adding zero, and you're ending up with six. So we can see that this is zero is known as the additive identity of any number because when you add zero to any number, you end up with what you started with. So this one right here is the identity property. Again, additive identity. Because when you add, you have ident you end up with what is identical to what you started with. Okay, so the keyword here is identical. So option number one is going to be the correct answer because it's, uh, zero is the additive identity. Okay, so the answer for this is option one. Let's take a look at two. What is this? Uh, negative six with six, you end up with zero. This is known as the additive, additive inverse. Okay. If you add something to a number and get zero, that is the additive inverse property. Okay? And in this one, this problem here, you see that 4 is being distributed to the two quantities right here. So this one is known as the distributive property. Distributive property. Okay? All right, distributive property, additive inverse. This is the ad additive identity, the correct answer. Uh, the last one. You notice that 4 and 6 are associated with each other, and in this case, 6 and 3 are associated with each other. This property is known as the associative property, okay? Associative property. It basically means that if you change the order of association, it doesn't change the sum. So uh, that's the associative property uh, of, of equality, okay? All right. Now let's move on to question number 10. It says, uh, Peter worked 8,900 feet from home to school. One mile equals 5,280 feet. How far to the nearest tenth of a mile did he walk? All right, so this uh, problem tests our skill on rounding and also on how to solve proportions, okay? I'm going to, going to set up two proportions and I'm, I'm going to try and see uh, if we can solve it, okay? So, um, I know that, I know that, um, one mile equals 5,280 feet. The question is, how many miles is 8,900 feet? So let's say x miles, x is the miles we don't know, equals 8,900, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a ratio, a ratio of the miles and a ratio of the feet, okay? So I'm gonna have one over x equals 5280 over 8900. This is true because they are identical, uh, this ratio. Okay? So these are the same when I divide two quantities that are the same, I'll get the same thing. Okay? So uh, we have this ratio set up. To solve this, you just cross multiply bottom to top and bottom to top. That gives us 8900 equals 5280x. Okay? And then to get x by itself, you divide both sides by 5,280. 5,280. 5,280. Um, and then you're going to end up with x equals 8,900 divided by 5,280. You can compute that uh, with the aid of your calculator. Um, let me get my calculator going real quick. So 8,900 8, divided by 5,280 equals 1.6856, okay? So it's approximately, um, approximately 1.6856, zero. So we're gonna round it to the 10th place. So where is the 10th place? This is the 10th place right after the ones place. Okay, going back, this is the ones. And this is the tenth place. I'm sorry, the tenth place. Okay? So if I want to round to the tenth place, look at the number behind it is bigger than is less than five, you keep it. 
the same if it's 5 or greater you round up so 8 is bigger 8 is bigger than 5 is 5 or greater so we need to round up so our answer is going to be approximately 1.7 uh, miles 1.7 miles that's our answer okay so the answer to this is option 4 all right let's move on to question 11 uh, it says is the equation a equals 21,000 parentheses 1 minus 3.12 to the t a model of exponential growth for decay and what is the rate percent of change per time period all right so let's go over our model for exponential growth real quick the model for exponential growth for decay is a equals a sub 0 times 1 plus or minus r to the t okay now let's break this down real quick um this is the original amount plus or minus if you have a minus that means decay decay for the sign and if the sign uh is a plus that means growth okay now this r that you see right there that r represents uh the rate in decimal form okay it's a rate in decimal form if you want to convert it to percent you just move the decimal back twice and you get it to percent and then t is basically the time a sub zero is the initial amount okay so uh let's go ahead and, and solve the problem so in this problem we have uh a equals 21,000 one minus 0 0.12 to the t all right let's see what we have here you notice that the sign is a negative and in the negative that means it's decay because we're going to be it's going to be getting less and less okay plus it's less than 100 percent so we can eliminate option one and two because these two indicate growth okay all right now the question is what is the percent of the uh decay rate is it 12 percent or 0.88 note this number right here before you subtract it from one that number is your growth rate okay so this, is, so this is the growth rate this is the growth rate so the growth rate is uh equal to 0 0.12 in decimal form 0 0.12 is the same thing as 12 over 100 right because if i divide this by one and i move the decimal point back twice top and bottom i'm going to end up with 12 over 100 which is equal to 12 percent all right, 12 percent is 12 over 100. So since we have 12 percent as a growth rate, that means our correct answer is option three. Okay, so there you have it. All right, moving along to question 12. It says the length of a rectangle is 15 and the width is W. The perimeter of the rectangle is at most 50. <coughs> Width inequality can be used to uh, find the longest possible width. So we know the formula for the uh, for the area of a rectangle. Let's say that uh, this is the length and this is the width. I'm sorry for the perimeter. So the perimeter basically means you go round. So if you go round, you're going to have two lengths and two widths, right? So perimeter is basically two length plus two width, right? So the perimeter says it has to be at most. So it could be 50 or less, right? So at most basically means that it can be bigger than that. It could be equal or less. So less than or equal to is the equality for at most, okay? All right, uh, so uh, this is at most. It is less than, if it's greater, it's going to be that. All right, so this is the equality we're using, less than or equal to. So um, let's set it up. I know with this inequality, you can already know that the answer is option two, but uh, let's well, go ahead and work out the whole problem, okay? So the perimeter is, the length is, the rectangle, I mean, the length is 15, right? So we're going to have two times the length, which is two times 15, plus double the width, has to be at most 50, so it's less than or equal to 50, right? So multiply that out, you have 30 plus 2w, and less than or equal to 50, so your correct option is option 2. Alright? Okay, moving along. Question 13. 
FedEx sees an advertisement for a car in a newspaper, which information will not be classified as quantitative. So for the uh, um, New York Williams exam, it's good to know the difference between qualitative and quantitative. Quantitative. Okay, let me just make an alteration to the spelling so that you can really see uh, where to focus in on. Okay, so we have qualitative and you have quantitative. Okay, the tatis are the same as what comes before that that helps you distinguish. Okay, so uh, qual qualitative basically has to do with this word right here suggests what? It suggests quality, right? What are the qual descriptive qualities of whatever you, your data set? And then quantitative basically means quantity, like measure. Okay, think about measure, measure like numerical. This is much more numerical. Okay, and then qualitative is much more descriptive. All right. All right. So we're talking about says we're talking about a car. So let's pick a random car for example. Let's say you you wanna you're looking at a Lambo Aventador. Okay, Aventador J. All right. So this is the model. And considering this Lambo Aventador J, let's say it's about. Uh, Half a million, uh, let's say it's about 500k, and the mileage is zero miles on it, and the car weighs about, I don't know, maybe let's say 1500 pounds, pretty heavy or lighter, and the model is uh, the J model, the Jota model, okay? So now let's look at these options and see which of these descriptions is not qualitative, okay? Which of these can we not ascribe a numerical value to? Cost of a car is a price. Can we as ascribe a number to a price? Absolutely. Our model car here is 500,000. So you can have, uh, ascribe a, a number to a cost, right? How about the mileage? If you look at the speedometer on a car, what does it show you? Numbers, right? So this car hasn't been driven, so it has zero. Point. It has zero miles on it. Okay, so mileage is, uh, is a qualitative measure zero miles and the model of the car is a Jota model okay they're different other models uh, but this one uh, can you use num a number to describe the model of the car absolutely not this is like a qualitative model okay this is qualitative all right this basically means freedom and because it just shows that the Jota model just tells you that the car is topless um, it's a convertible so it's, you can ascribe a number, a numerical quantity or a measure to the model of the car. You can just give it a name, okay? It could be model one, but it's not a measure. It's just a description of the car, okay? How about the weight of the car? Can you ascribe a number to it? Absolutely, 1,500 pounds is a numerical measure that you can assign to the weight of a car, okay? So mileage, costs, and weight are qualitative. Model is not. This is qualitative. All right, so the answer is option three. All right, now let's move on to the next question. Oh boy. Back. Well, I guess that's it. Oh, right, anyway, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. Please uh, subscribe to my channel so you can get updates to the future, the next parts. Uh, you can also request help on my uh, Twitter page, MicroServe1. And also subscribe uh, to my challenges by clicking here. You can share with your friends. More videos can be found on MicroServe.com. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.